We're back to talk about PlayStation. Uh, we're also playing games as well, because of course this past week, Richie, we jumped into Back for Blood, one of the PlayStation Plus Extra and Premium games for uh, the month of January. Uh, any quick thoughts on yeah. Back for Blood for those maybe thinking about checking it out as part of the subscription service? If you like Left for Dead, you like Back for Blood. It's basically the same. It has some like weird card building mechanics where you, I think they kind of perks and stuff to upgrade your character and stuff. We didn't go too much into that in that in depth, but it's a it's a good game. It's if you are like if you do like that kind of four person co op sh- shoot some zombies Left for Dead style game like World War Z as well. You will like Back for Blood, so it's worth checking out. It's on Game Pass. It's on PlayStation Plus. So if you like the sound of it, there's basically no reason not to give it a go. Yeah, most people will no doubt have an entry point for it as well. Uh, and of course, before we get into the bulk of the show, special shout out to all of our wonderful Helix heroes out there, the fantastic few people who do support us that extra bit further um, and get extra content early, just like this very show from as little as 99p. Uh, shout out to Al Davis Music and Link TV for renewing their subscription and retaining their Helix Hero membership. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get into the bulk of the show, Rob, what have you been playing in your uh, time this week that you've had free? I've been putting... A- decent amount of hours into Ghost of Tsushima, 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 whatever. Um, yeah, I think I've just entered the third act and is it, I think Spoil is a fair game for this game now, right? Like, it's been um, a while, right? I would say so. We're gonna, for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about spoilers for Ghost of Tsushima, so if you don't want to be spoiled, skip ahead a bit. Okay. Anyway. Three, two, one. They fucking killed Sora. Yeah. Like, did you not see that coming? when she got hit by like a few arrows yeah but i was like i think i thought like one that wants to kill taka off that was it and i was like i thought that was the emotional oh, punch but then taka was no. brutal actually as well yeah and then i thought oh like maybe she's just got tired and she lays down for a bit mm. and then like yuna comes and, and, and saves us or whatever but no then she's just buried under some rocks yeah there's some what su- the fuck surprising yeah. like big moments it's, in that game it's and the so cell was only 200 meters away as well mm, yeah could have got back there yeah there's some <sighs> awesome moments god uh, I, I love ghost of Tsushima. i think it's definitely my favorite uip game of the last mm. kind of five six oh years. yeah probably did oh 100 i can't even think so of as a consequence better. of the horse dying i i've just abandoned mm. all stealth and i'm just in full slaughter mode for the rest of the game right like i wonder if that's what the game designer d- intended for you to fully embrace being the ghost at that point like like shit because you shit at that point in the story kind of getting rid of your attachments aren't you? mm. from being a samurai yeah, yeah there's nothing holding so you now back like, to that old well like yeah. your father's disowned you your friend's dead uh, your horse, everything. But uh, yeah. there was a moment actually when you mentioned the name, Rob. I didn't know who you were talking about because you get to choose. I thought of, Taka of, when you said Sora. Actually, yeah. that's when my mind went. You get to choose went. of the three horses that. You oh take, shit! Yeah, right? you do. Don't, yeah, so yeah. I, I call. I call this Sora. Different. I think I might have picked Mine's Sora. Ca- well. Mine was Kage. And yeah, I, I think I picked one. Kage as well. But then it was as soon as you started talking, I was like, oh wait, I know. Yeah, I thought he was on about yeah. Taka as well. Um, but yeah, so yeah, you get that yeah. emotional beat of being hit with two. So. Saving Grace, Rob, there's two other horses out there that you didn't pick that you rejected at the beginning. Uh, and they're fine. And they're fine. Yeah, but... Like, so you're I responsible like, for Sora's death. But I picked, like, the special edition one, and, like, I'll give you the best one's dead now. <laughs> so it's like... Well, there's always horses. You should just I, call it Roach and move on with your life. Yeah, I think I went on my second playthrough with the special edition one, but, like, at my first playthrough of games, you know, when you get, like, pre, pre-ordered, pre like, bonus DLC and items and stuff, I don't like to use it. Mm. And, like, no, a first I, playthrough. It feels like I'm not playing the game as you should be playing it. Like Yeah, like, I thought the horse was okay because it's basically it's just like a cosmetic saddle. But, like, you get that yeah. special hero of Tsushima armor as well, which I just didn't think yeah. was right to use. Cause it just... Yeah, I didn't even use that in my second playthrough. Like, Yeah, it just looks I, out of I place, doesn't it? I want because I want to experience the game properly, not have this badass armor to just effectively cheat my way through the first half of the game. Is that the one that like kind of regens mm-hmm. your ghost power or something like that, like instantly? Something like that, yeah. yeah. yeah I just it I just gives like find... such an imbalanced boost in mm. like damage and yeah. like resistance and stuff. The cosmetics. Were do so you do the thing where, based on the mission, you change up your armor as well, so you like make sure like the attire suits what you do rather than just going full samurai armor the whole and then trying to sneak around. No, I I I use the um. I tend to use like the clan Sakai armor, but I I've upgraded yeah. it fully, but I don't enable like the cosmetics upgrades. So like, oh, so it still looks a bit broken. Well, it's kind of like the second stage. Oh no, of it, that's like yeah. So like the second stage of it has like more bulk to it, 
but it doesn't have like the full on kind of and I didn't I didn't use like yeah. the under helmet either. I just used like the the mm. the small kind of sneaky I, one. I kinda like picked what like armor I was using based on what was going on in the story. So after you get like disowned, I stopped using like the Sakai armor and stuff. I stopped using like samurai look and stuff. I mm. went more like the travelers you get the attire. Ghost armor, you? Yeah, I'd u- I'd use the ghost I'd use I'd for most time I'd just use like the travelers attire, but if I knew I was doing a mission going stealth, that's when I put the ghost armor on. But at mm. moments when it's like you go to back, lay siege to a castle, like that's when I put the proper armor on and stuff. Mm. No, so I don't. I don't role play yeah. in that much depth. Yeah, yeah Richie I don't takes usually his RPGs in games. very seriously. Richie sat there. I don't with actually an actual, don't usually like, do that depth, but Katana it's because they have different. <laughs> they have different stats as well. So I was like, well, this armor actually suits what I'm doing in the story as well as the gameplay. Yeah. Yeah. I but as you can tell, I'm very much into it at the moment. I should pick yeah. the one that just looks the nicest. <laughs> and where and where that one is. Yeah. but yeah ghost of shame is a, an amazing game like absolutely amazing i think actually in, in hindsight reflecting back i think i actually prefer ghost of shame 2 horizon as far as the new ips go that have launched in the last few I years i think i'd agree yeah i, I agree yeah like horizon's no doubt fan- fantastic for what it is mm-hmm. but there's just something about i think playing in feudal japan which i think i've never experienced in games before like outside yeah. of you and me playing like dinosaur stories back in the day rob like ancient china like this is the nearest I've got to like telling of like a, an, an Asian story that's happened like with depth characters like um, yeah absolutely just, it's on such a good scale and as I well. think yeah there's just enough like peppering of like challenging combat mm. without it getting annoying like apart from like a few that we use like we use our fights which I just found annoying because he was that took me a while to figure his pattern mm. all the rest of it's kind of quite balanced in terms of. If you fuck up majorly, yeah, you'll pay, but it's not devastating and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah I have no bad thing yeah. to say about the game, apart from Combat, Sorry, Combat's so good as well. I just mm-hmm. reminisce now, like, the, like when you learn all the different stances in the sword play, and, so, and when you go to ghost mode, that's just, you feel like the ultimate, like, as a video game should do, you feel like such a badass when, like, everything just goes black and white, yeah. and you just mess shit up. It's, oh, it's so yeah. satisfying. And all the shit, that, it, it, that, when you retake Lord... Um, the castle. No, not when you... No, it's not when you retake it. It's when you defend the... Like the outpost. I can't remember what it's called now. It's like I, the I villages. I you mean, yeah. And they break down the gate and you're like, oh, I'm yeah. not having any of this shit. Yeah, and then like you like you all yeah. kind of charge collectively. Oh, such a good it is. cinematic game sequence. It's incredible. It really is. So if you've not checked yeah. out Ghost of Tsushima, everyone, uh, definitely go do that. Is it part of PlayStation Plus at all? I feel like it's part it of... It is, like, yeah. The, it's the on the, I, I'm, I'm playing it on the is premium it? plan. Did, wasn't it, didn't it bring it out as part of, you know, when they first launched the PS5, they had that kind of collection of, like, yeah, like if you almost were, classics from PS4. I can't remember what they called us. I think it was just the... But is it part of that? Was it part of that? I think it's just called the PlayStation Plus Collection, and it is, yeah, it's like the greatest yeah. hits of, of PS4, essentially, and uh, Ghost mm-hmm. of Shame is undoubtedly one of them. Um, yeah. if you and ever, the PS5 version's on there as well. I'd recommend, Rob, it might so. be worthwhile if we can get it around to a stream as well. The um, Ghost of Shame Legends multiplayer mode is fantastic. Yeah, we should. Yeah, like, it, you'll enjoy that so I, I, so much. I did accidentally go into that when there was like I found a guy and I just started talking to him, and then it's like, oh, oh yeah, he's trying yeah. to force me into. But definitely, yeah, it's um, it's just so good. It it could have been a standalone game, and the fact that it was like a free update that came out after the campaign. Like I remember it dropping, thinking, what they're just going to yeah. add multiplayer after the fact randomly, and it was like, yeah, yeah. it's pretty damn good as well. It's like, oh shit, it is. Yeah. It's re- I think it will be a standalone game in the future. Oh, I think that absolutely. was them just experimenting. Mm. They've already got an install base with this game. Let's just give it give it free. Let's see if see how people vibe with it. Because yep. if, if it if it came and didn't do well, like all right, not didn't lose much, but because it was received well, they now can probably build a full game around that concept. Yeah. Although there's quite a bit of depth there already. Absolutely. Um, so quickly, Richie, what have you been playing? Um, I have played both Persona 3 Portable and Persona 4 Gold. You finished them? No. no I played about an hour and a half. Yeah, this is um, I'm not going to talk too much here because we are going to talk. We talked about it a bit yesterday in X Pass. Um, but, but yeah, we have first first looks on the channel, so go give them a watch. Mm, yeah, if you're a fan of some JRPGs, they are, I think, literally revered as the best or some of the best. Hand sound. They're definitely up there, yeah. Wonderful. Go off the boots on that one. Uh, I've just been chipping away more at The Witcher 3 in between um, some big work projects that I've been doing. So um, I think I've just about met Dandelion. I'm just about to meet Dandelion, which I'm guessing right, is, yeah. is Yaskia from the TV show, right? The Bard, that's who mm-hmm. he yeah. is. They changed his name for 
reasons. Yeah, I can imagine. Because at the same time, I, I told you guys I've bought the books. I've started reading the first, the Blood of Elves Witcher book. And like that pretty much chapter one opens with this guy called Dandelion who's singing tale of w- Geralt of w- Revere and stuff. And I'm like, is this just... Yeah, skip. I've only, I only yeah. know the TV show as a point of reference. And then I'm kind of going back over... So then, but now I'm playing the game and I'm about to meet Dandelion. I'm like, oh, so I've got kind of like a trifecta of like <laughs> pop culture working on me from all different angles. Now I'm waiting to that point where they all crescendo together. I'm like, I get it. It make everything makes sense now. I can see the Matrix almost in front of me yeah. of the Witcher world. But yeah, I'm enjoying it. I'm getting more into it. I think, which it was a slow burn. I was at first, I was thinking, am I just going to get too overwhelmed with how big the game is and everything to do? But like most video games, I think you give them a, a decent run. And you start to sink into how you play them and what mm-hmm. the world is. And although, if, if when you focus on the story, the story grips you, you get sucked into that world. Then you start it, the side of yeah, the world doesn't bother you as to much. It makes more sense. And coming across like these little side stories and characters and and whatnot. But I'll still be honest. I've still not crafted or made any potions or shit. That's still well beyond what I can be bothered to do. I I very rarely did as well. Yeah, but apart I'm from playing, like health potions and stuff. But yeah, I'm just happy eating oh. bread and rotten meat to kind of heal myself so but I'm, I'm getting better at the combat now so i'm not taking as much damage as i was early doors but uh, yeah i'm enjoying it i'm enjoying it so plenty to play and of course we'll be playing more video games this coming week as well on thursday as part of our weekly live stream with you the wonderful community if you do want to join our discord server you can uh, jump in there and recommend what you'd like us to play with you but uh, we will let you know so keep it locked to the channel so you know what we're playing as it comes about uh, right, gentlemen, let's get into the thick of the news. We've got a busy show full of some fun, exciting topics. So, Rob, if you could do us the honor of introducing us to the... Properly prepared PlayStation perusing points, a.k.a. The News. The News. <laughs> the News. He did it again, folks. He did it again. Um, yeah, I, I didn't go do it as long, though, so... Great show this week, as I mentioned, starting off with story number one, just dropped last night, actually only just made it into the show, uh, our headline story, Marvel's Avengers are going to be reaching their end game after just three years, that's correct, Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics confirmed that support for Marvel's Avengers will officially end on the 30th of September 2023. Uh, The live service action game will be just three years old, having first launched on PlayStation 4 back in September 2020. Uh, You'll be able to keep playing the game after the above date in both solo and multiplayer, but there will be no further updates or additional content beyond that point. Uh, What's more, it will not be available to purchase on digital storefronts. Starting 31st of March, all market, challenge cards and shipment cosmetic content will be made completely free for all players, uh, which of course is a nice gesture, and this will occur alongside the launch of the title's final update, which promises some final gameplay balance adjustments. Um, Now before I hand it over to you two, I've um, played this game extensively, I think I've got about 90 plus hours in it, Uh, so I'm probably the biggest fan of Marvel's Avengers here on the show. Um, It's sad to see it go, but I understand the decisions why. Um, I don't think Square Enix was the right studio, well Crystal Dynamics in particular, to look after the multiplayer aspect of this game. I think they nailed the story campaign with Kamala Khan, and I think they just kind of got lost in the weeds with either too big of an IP, what they wanted the game to be. It probably launched too early, even though they delayed it a few times. And overall, I think the the biggest detriment to it all was that uncanny valley was it, they never got official MCU voices or likeness. See, I, and I don't, think that pulled the rug out from under them. I really don't think that's the biggest problem at all. I think if the game was good enough, you get over that. For me, this uh, single player stuff was great, but once you got into the multiplayer stuff, if you ripped off the IP, you got a very six out of ten game there. It it was I just found it bland and boring and just repetitive. There was it was only the Avengers IP that made that game interesting, in my opinion. When you got to the multiplayer, it just felt like it just conceptually wasn't very good. What would you have done like, differently? The single player stuff, I don't know. For me, as a multiplayer game. You won't actually have a play as a multiplayer game. When I've played with you, Chris, I always just felt like we were in the same world, mm-hmm. in the same map. But that's it. There was no like synergy between our characters at all. There was no need for any sort of strategy, and you were just all the worlds were just cook, cookie cutter with basic same missions, basic same enemies, and it was just like. It's just it just felt really really bland yeah. in my opinion. The variety was incredibly so, poor. When, when we've played the story stuff, mm. I've en- I enjoy playing through the stories because I like Avengers, I like Marvel um, in terms of the IP. So when the IP was doing the heavy lifting, it's like I had a good time. Mm-hmm. But once you get past the story, it's like 
I don't know why I want to level up my characters. I never understood why should I level up my characters? What's mm. the purpose? It, it goes back to the game being confused with like, it wants to be a games as a service, but at the same time, tell a story. And again, I think very few franchises have done that. I think Destiny does a good job of it in retaining that player base. But with Marvel's Avengers, like you've got the potential to sell to tell so many stories, and we've seen that like just by proxy of what what they are anyway. They're superhero characters who've got decades worth of comic book heritage to, to pull from, and they just didn't didn't do it. They didn't land, they didn't land that Quinjet as they say. Yeah, when you go to games like Destiny, it's like why do you level up your character? You level up your character so you can do the end game content, so you can experience more of what the game has to offer from both like a story and law point of view, mm-hmm. and also you you are joining a fire team, you are co- coordinating with your teammates and how to take down bosses. There wasn't any of that in the Avengers. You just there. Yeah. Like even in like missions like the defend the door missions, which were kind of the closest to where you need actual teamwork. Mm-hmm. There wasn't even that, the depth of the teamwork was like you stand by the door, I'll go take care of this lot, and then next one you go that while I take care of the door. And that was about it. Yeah, the like, the whole design process for the kind of four player online really wasn't thought out that well at all. Like like yeah. I said, I think variety was its biggest thing where it just felt repetitive after a while. Like it's all well and good having a roster of like eight plus characters. Um, some of them feel more similar to others, but yeah, like you said, at the end of the day, if you're doing the same just, mission on repeat in the same environments with the same robot villains or the same spider it's grinding bots, it's like... Mm. For the sake of grinding, and it just never really... I could never see the objective of why I should go in and level up my characters, like other than just to have bigger numbers. Yeah, it, That's all it felt like. It's just like just bigger numbers. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, and do more damage, but the enemies have more health. Yeah, I mean, that's like, gamification kind of 101, isn't it? Is you're always striving for that bigger number. Like, all video games really are, is, for the most part, yeah. is you're trying to big big yourself up so you're a bit stronger, you've got a bit more health, like abilities, perks, skills. Like, you're always adding on. But like you said, what is that end game, that end goal? And yeah. Avengers just never really had it outside of the campaign. It was just grinding for grinding's sake. I, again, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed that. Like, jumping in as one of my favourite heroes oh. as Thor and smashing some shit up with, like, brain dead, just monotony was kind of what I wanted had. sometimes. But with how, how, conde- how like, how crowded, like, the multiplayer space is at the moment, you kind of need to step up and, like, give people a reason more than just hey this is you're playing as your favorite superhero to play mm. a game like like you mentioned destiny this you could just be playing something like something like destiny yeah. you could, or god knows what else if you want to play with friends you maybe you're playing fortnite maybe you're playing call of duty warzone any of these sort of star wars battlefront i'd, I'd say is even a better online experience yeah there's certainly it's, some decisions that didn't go the way i think marketing for one the the had the problem with kind of Spider Man being exclusive to PlayStation pissed off a lot of the fan base as well. Like you need to buy this on PS five or PS four if you want to play Spider Man, which again, Spider Man's kind of a key player in the Avengers, so just gatekeeping him behind one platform, I think ruffled a few feathers annoyingly. And yeah, I think they just there's a lot of stuff, but for me, yeah, the roster of the kind of villains was just weak. Like fighting task t- fighting Taskmaster and Abomination fifty times over. It just just started to fall on its feet a little bit. Um, Rob, what do you think this game could look like after the fact? Because they do say in their in their post that all the cosmetics and stuff are going free, which is great to see the kind of game see it out. It does say those solo multiplayer will still be there. There'll just be no more updates. So, does this just is this game I mean, still fully playable indefinitely, or at one point in maybe another two years they're going to have to announce like actually the servers are going to be pulled now, and it's kind of yeah, hundred percent. They're going to have to do that, aren't they? Like. I guess you'll see like a bit of a spike when people check out like new cosmetics and things like that mm. from existing play like from, well, I guess lapsed players should you say but as you've both said like despite that there's still no reason to come back to it either, like at all I think it's just going to turn into more and more of a ghost town until mm-hmm. it gets to a tipping point where they can just say oh well no one's using it I just turn the server off and then it gets put in the dustbin of live service game yeah. like games really which is a real shame but yeah, as you guys of, have both um, said, there was too many for, like mishandles, yeah. I guess. Because it, their, I think their approach to updating the game seemed to be rather than fixing the core pr- fundamental issues of the multiplayer, just like add a new hero and a small and like a five-hour campaign around that hero. 
that seemed to be yeah. the only approach they ever took. So, the, so while they were fun experiences, you play, we play for. I think they were even like maybe sometimes like two hours because we we finished a few on stream. Yeah, I think we did. So like, you play through, and then I wouldn't touch it again after that. Yeah, I think the Black Panther War for Wakanda content was like the biggest expansion ever. They added a whole new world in in the form of Wakanda, and then I think me and Richie like got through it in like two and a bit hours, and it was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So and uh, like arguably as well, like like Marvel as a as a property now is in like a bit of a weak phase of mm. kind of creative to draw from to put into the game so they've had their i imagine there's there's been that consideration as well right yeah my my i think looking back in hindsight it's easy looking over three years and i think because it launched to not critically acclaim and some a lot of multiplayer problems the the way game development works is they obviously had to address the problems first and foremost which put them on the back foot i remember this came out kind of like peak covid as well so 2020 this is like lockdown everyone sent working from Mm -hmm. home and so we've got to factor that into, but I genuinely think all the problems at launch then had a kind of snowball effect when, in an ideal world, I believe this game wanted to get Hawkeye content out when the uh, Disney Plus show was out. She-Hulk was rumoured. Every time a new Marvel movie comes out, like Black Widow, drop the Black Widow content. And because mm-hmm. of all the delays and the problems and the fires they had to put out early doors, everything kind of become dislodged from the original schedule and you ended up getting like Hawkeye months later, Black Widow well after the movie came out. And then they started to announce like the, the MCU counterpart skins. Like we just got the Thor um, Love and Thunder or the original Thor outfit from the MCU like this past week. It's like that should have been there a lot longer than two and a half years into your game's life cycle to kind of bring those fans on who are watching the movies and enjoying uh, the content that's yeah. on Disney Plus, and again, I just think it was mismanaged from the staff. But at the end of the day, it was their own fault for making Crystal Dynamics, who are famed for making amazing single-player games in Tomb Raider, and not mm-hmm. just letting them make a single-player again, Avengers game. The single-player stuff works really well. Crystal Dynamics shine. You, I mean, if you can pick it up cheap, it's worth playing through the the main single-player campaign. I've always held that. Yeah. But with the every time they brought out new content, you mentioned bring out new heroes in time with the shows. I still feel like all you're doing at that point is you're just capitalizing on the IP rather than actually trying to make a good game. You just bring out more of a mediocre game. Yep, but it works, doesn't it, for marketing? Like, if I'm going to watch Hawkeye over Christmas, then I'm like, ooh, to an extent. Hawkeye's but an if, like, game. again, when Hawkeye, the Hawkeye content dropped, we both jumped in, we had a good time on stream, and then I never touched it again. So you have that small, you have that spike, but it's very much a sharp spike, and then back to plateauing like, a lower than you'd like level. Was that not games as a service? Games as a set, like Destiny no, has games a massive service. spike, you want... and then it just yeah, it, off you to will. The you, you you will always have that massive spike, but you have to have that kind of base level to maintain itself. And it never had. And that. Avengers never had that. You were just relying on the spikes. I mean, you don't like fighting Mordok bots fifty times over and over again. <laughs> I'm telling you, Mordok's no. going to be a shit hot commodity come Ant Man uh, next month, apparently. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see anyway. But yes, uh, End Game is in fact here for Avengers. And um, who knows what we'll see? At least, at least it frees up Crystal Dynamics to move on. We actually, sh- we should probably clarify as well. Remember, Crystal Dynamics not part of Square Enix anymore. They're owned by the Embracer Group. So you've also got that. This yeah. might just be a, a business decision where the studio mm-hmm. and the licensing agreements might be are with Square yeah. Enix and with Disney. And now Crystal Dynamics, like, why? Why are we working on a game? We don't technically work for the parent company anymore. Like, are they just seeing out their contract, which might just, in fact, be three years, and then that's they're out, and they've, they've moved off legally to other projects? As negative as, as I've been, I think they are doing it right. They're kind of going, right, guys, after this point, which is in like literally like eight months, we're not going to support the game any further. However, you will still be able to access it, and I think they'll turn the servers off when their numbers could drop below mm-hmm. a certain thing, whether that's in one year, six months, two years, whatever. So if you want to keep the game alive, just keep playing yeah. it, I think is the answer. But It's not um, free to play, but I do think it's part of Game Pass and PlayStation Plus. So it kind of is as well. Yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. So just keep it going that little bit further but by the fact that it's free. Um, but moving on to our second story of the week. Uh, PlayStation VR 2 is on the horizon. It's literally at the time of recording, one month away. Uh, none of us are buying into it, but PlayStation is surely going to start ramping up the marketing for this as we head into the final four weeks before launch. Uh, pre-orders are still available now, and I don't know whether that's telling for you two, but if you go on the pre-order page, you can still pre-order. So this isn't out of stock, like the mm-hmm. PS5 was impossible to get hold of. This is like, no, no, 
pre-orders launched over like just before Christmas, you can still just go on and get your order in now if you want to, which is... I don't know if that's telling or not, but we've got a list of new games on the horizon. Uh, PlayStation confirmed this week that PSVR 2 will be launching with more than 30 games uh, across a launch window, which they've said is through March, with a little asterisk next to it. So traditionally, it's it's not going to be down launch day, but they've given themselves a couple of additional weeks to, to get some new titles out. Uh, and they gave us a list of 13 new games that get added to the list now. I'm not going to break them down and go into them all individually. I think we can all agree the biggest one is Horizon Call of the Mountain. If that one hits, this could be a hot commodity. Like, you have to try this out. You have to get VR just for this one game, which is a tall ask because it's it's an expensive mm-hmm. piece of kit. However, yeah. they do need to sprinkle the launch in with many other titles to make people really see that they're getting the value for money. Uh, I'll throw it over to you first, Rob. Is there any particular games that stand out for you in, in this list? That if you I were mean, to get a VR, have... I should say... I wouldn't get a PlayStation VR, but I will say that like VR as in general has been kind of catching my eye more and more than it has done in the past. Mm-hmm. Purely, that's based on kind of medieval kind of sword fighting. You want to play type of games like VR, that, don't you? Basically, yeah. Just to, I want I want I want to do a stream on it with you just to see how much you get in VR as well. <laughs> you um, might be better I'd probably in VR. be better in VR, yeah. Probably, yeah. But um, out of this list, like. They all seem like relatively decent titles. The one that's speaking to me purely as a, a boxing fan is the um, the Creed Rise to Glory kind of tie-in game. And I know it's not going to be kind of... You know, it's going to be a tie-in game either way, but that kind of hand-to-hand combat type of thing in VR is, is what kind of appeals to me. So if I had to pick one out of the list, it would be that one. Yes, yeah, so you kind of... Your, your two VR hands essentially just become the gloves, right? It's essentially just Wii Boxing, but just updated. That's the that's the yeah. best comparison ever. It's just Wii Boxing, <laughs> but you're you're in the world. Um, does yeah. it's what Wii Boxing wishes it could be? I mean, yeah, yeah. Like Wii Boxing was just wild flailing. I imagine this is going to be the same. Yeah. And again, we spoke about Avengers, but Creed Three comes out soon, right? In the next two, few months. Yeah, something like that. So you've got that kind of that marketing beat to go with it. Um, I guess if you're going to tie a, a boxing game to any IP, it's got to be Rocky and Creed, right? I wonder why they went for Creed yeah, over Rocky. Do you think that conversation happened? I think it's just the in th- property now, isn't it? I think Creed yeah, is Rocky yeah. for this generation. Creed, right? Yeah, I'd agree with Robin that just I think Creed is actually, in terms of a brand, probably just stronger than Rocky right now. Just because it's more rele- it's more relevant, mm. like. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Um, but yeah, uh, Creed Rise to Glory, that's, all, that's a good one out there. Again, it's something a bit different. It is on Oculus and Quest, I think, as well. So it's, it's a known quantity. So I think there's mm-hmm. a general theme through a lot of the PSVR 2 launch that we've kind of seen this before. And I think that's where it's coming in for a bit of stick, actually, where a lot of the titles launching, they're not brand new launch titles. They are, well, we've seen this on the original PSVR. It's like Job Simulator and Tetris Effect and stuff. They're like, well, I've already played them. Like They're fun. They're great. But there's a lot of things on this list which I think a lot of people probably own these. If, they, if they're a tech enthusiast and they own PSVR 2 1, they're probably going to look at this list and think, you're going to make me buy them again for PSVR 2? PSVR 2 mm-hmm. 1. Because there is no, there's no free path to upgrade here. So like Moss, the fantastic little story game with the mouse, that's included here in the launch lineup. But I own Moss. I bought it for PSVR 1. But there's no free upgrade path. You basically have to just buy the game again, which I think is risky and pissing off your existing tech enthusiast fan base and anyone looking to get in is like, well, I'm already half in, but now you stop me from getting half in by pushing me back out with more additional cost. Yeah, so- yeah, definitely. And I think some of them have like a 10, like a, there's like a $10 upgrade or something. Mm. Like I think Tetris effect is, has one and like, but still yeah, it's, but it's $10 it's upgrade stick. for a game that you might already own on a platform that's already costing you 530 pounds to buy. Yeah, it's just a bit of a piss take, I, isn't it? Like, yeah, well, I can't get over the cost on this because I think VR is cool. But when I was thinking about the story the other day, I was like, what What does VR need to do to get my attention? It's like, well, when I think, you think about your time gaming, it's your free time. So it's not just ga- you're just not competing with just gaming. You're competing against maybe spending time with friends, going to the pub, going... Like maybe if you into sports, go do a sport. Your all your hobbies and interests. It's competing for that same amount of time. 
So mm-hmm. for, for £530, for me, I think VR games have to be better than non-VR games. And while they look, they all everything on this list, I think, looks like a good game, I think they all look distinctly m- missable. None of them are calling out to me as this is a game that I must play. Maybe Call of the Mountain is the only one that comes close. But even then, it just feels like a VR version of Horizon. And I don't think that's enough for the price point. Then you add in the fact that you don't get, the if you own PSVR VR 1 games, you don't get them over. And I think the only way for me to even really consider PSVR is it needs to half the price point of the hardware. Mm. And this 30 game list that you get should just be there as like, a starter pack. Just, I think, yeah, I think it really, or even if it is, a, you get all these on PS Plus Premium. So if you're a premium member, you get all these games for free. Then it's like, you can start to justify the additional cost. Because if you're interested in VR and you don't already have a PS5, you're talking over a £1,000 before you even bought a game. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and it's, it's such like, a big barrier just, for entry. It's way too big for what is expe- effectively a cool peripheral. Yeah, and again, I, I've always felt with a lot of VR stuff is it's more it's more giving experiences. So, like, I think yeah. one of the titles they've announced in, in this one was uh, Kayak VR. Which... Oh, it looks Kayak is one of the ones I've like I've looked at. I was like, this looks pretty damn cool. It, it does. I, I like the fact it's got. A, it seems to have a lot of pace behind it. It looks beautiful. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's but different. But again, I just enjoy an playing that game. Mm. But is that an experience that is worth five hundred thirty pounds plus the price of the game? Yeah, that's it. Like, it looks gorgeous. And again, I'm sure all of the new hardware that's gone into it, like PSVR 2's headset is undoubtedly going to be I, the best quality headset in, at the cheapest price point in terms of value on the market. But that price point is still, like Richie said, all in the bundle. Way too high. A grand, which... Yeah, mm-hmm. I could spend that, like, that say, that £530, how, that's like 10 games mm. on just PlayStation. On, that's more than, that's probably more than, like, the AAA games I will buy this year. Yeah. On PS5, these so I was like, I just can't square away that level of cost. I think you mentioned Chris that it's not out of stock. I think that might be why. Mm-hmm. I th- I've got a feeling. I, I mean, it feels like PlayStation want VR to be a thing more than gamers want VR to be a thing at the moment. I think the industry and wants it to be a thing because they it's face cool. it, there's not it much is more. It's really you can do. really cool. But again, it comes. It does come back to it, like that price point, and you're competing for my times. Like if I was to play that kayak VR Mirage, which looks awesome, mm-hmm. or Cree, Cree VR, or Horizon Call of the Mountain, that's time that I'm not playing something else. Yeah. So it has to be for me. It just has to be better than what else I could be playing. Absolutely, and for me, it comes back as such someone who's such a play, a big PlayStation fan. It comes back to down to like research and development, and I genuinely think. If PlayStation were to come out this like this coming February with a PlayStation handheld that costs four nine nine, so just short of the VR price point, and it had a Horizon portable game and remote play cloud gaming element in some capacity and a in an OLED screen like the Nintendo Switch does. What you mean like a st- basically a Steam Deck style yeah, thing? I think that mm-hmm. would sell infinitely more than a vr headset i really do oh i'd be very tempted i'd be in i'd be in day one because i'm like yeah i love i like i love my switch but it's just my pokemon machine tell me i get all my playstation stuff and remote play and it's a legit sony piece of hardware i'd pay 500 pound for that without even thinking as opposed to vr where i'm like "Uh, when am i going to use it are the experiences whereas with the handheld one if you tell me i can play god of war ragnarok but stream it or cloud play it or whatever on this device then yeah because we've said time and time again a few shows richie like i'm not really in the market for a steam deck i like the concept of it but i'm not a big i don't have a big steam library and and all this other things but if it was a playstation one i'm just so much more inclined to get and i think all the research costs going into vr i'm like look how many switches are selling 140 million you're really looking at that panhel portable gaming console and going it's "Eh, it's not really for us it's like 140 million units sold so only they've got out of their portable gaming market as at the time it's just exploded. Yeah. <laughs> like, but the thing is, um, spoilers for pers- my Persona playthroughs, but I am contemplating playing them games just through the cloud on my phone. I've even just off my Kishi because Persona 3 Portable, well, keys in the name, came out on the PSP. Persona 4 Golden came out on the PS Vita. Hmm. They are games designed to be played in a portable form factor. 
So I'm, I'm tempted just, well, if I'm playing through the cloud, I can maybe, I can play on my phone occasionally, I can play on my Xbox. Yeah. I could even play on my PC, like just sync all these free saves up. So if I had, I, I mean, I've said before, I don't really like the ki- the Kishi that well. I think the but for the price point, the buttons just feel a bit cheap and mushy, and and I think the form factor of a phone, even a large phone like I've got, the screen's a bit smaller than I'd like. Mm-hmm. But it's still so. If like if I could get for a reasonable price point a PlayStation Vita two, mm-hmm. I'd be very tempted by that. Yeah. It's it. I like I, again. Everything tells me that one day it will happen. Like I just, I think it has to happen. Like, I don't think the Nintendo yeah. Switch. I don't think anyone I, can look at the success of the Switch and the Steam Deck as a company who puts out games and hardware and goes, "Do we really not want in on this market?" And then they've got an entire hope division with dedicated to VR. And you're like, "Why?" Like, there's so many better things you could be doing instead. But I hope they succeed. I just don't re- for, for the price. I just don't really see much of a route. Yeah. But, I mean, it depends what, how you define success. Well, that's but, true. But I think the, the original PSVR once saw like 5 million, which was like less than 5% of the install base of the PS4, which again, it's, it's still more VR headsets than any other company. But Yeah, and but I think that was at a point when VR was taking off a bit. There yeah. was a bit of more general interest in VR than it is right now. Absolutely. That interest in VR, I think it has like, de- decayed a bit over time. So it's like VR two, and I just don't. I've got a feeling Sony are going to look at the launch of VR two, and it's going. The numbers are not going to be anywhere near where they hope. And again, us. I really hope I'm wrong. Well, us three again, but, as enthusiasts, if we're not too hot on it, we've said time and time again. Mm-hmm. Who's like is, is like little Timmy asks for it, and his mum goes, "Oh, it's your birthday next month. How much is it? Five hundred and fifty quid." Plus then it's an extra <laughs> fifty for Shut Horizon, up, Timmy, yeah. and then I need the controller charging dock, ma'am. That's like an extra forty. And it's just like, no, sorry, Timmy. Maybe when you get a job as an adult, your own job, and then by then you're an adult and you think, no, fuck, I've got bills to pay. I can't afford a VR headset for 500. And less time to actually play VR. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we'll see again. If there's any games in there uh, that do interest you, let us know in the comments below. And more importantly, if you're thinking of getting a PSVR 2 uh, headset, uh, let us know as well. There's a bunch of games on that list. There's a baseball bat game. There's Res Infinite. There's Tetris Effect, like I said, but... Baseball bat simulator. <laughs> it's called What the Bat. Yeah. And it literally, again, looks like I would have a fun time playing fake baseball, but not for more for than an half hour an too. hour. I wouldn't even say an hour, to be honest. I'd probably yeah. have a, like, a little chuckle and then think, why did I pay 15 quid for this game or whatever its, it's <laughs> launch price? The only thing saving grace with VR is the, the prices for the games are generally cheaper. I think they usually come in around like 25 to 30 odd pound. But then again, does that, yeah. does that say something about I mean, the quality? Or the perceived quality. If you are a VR enthusiast, if it, if this was a completely standalone thing and you didn't need the PS5, I think the price would be okay. Yeah, more reasonable. But hopefully it won't get cancelled, unlike the next project we'll be talking about. Ubisoft, again, going through a bit of a rough time. We'll talk more. We talked more about it, I should say, yesterday on the x Pass podcast, our weekly Xbox podcast. Go check that out see how the green side lives. Um, over on Ubisoft headquarters, they've confirmed that Project Q has been cancelled. So we know last week's news told us that they've cancelled three unannounced projects, um, but it looks like one of their previously announced ones, Project Q, in fact, was included in that. It was teased last year as a battle arena game, but it wasn't a battle royale game. Um, and it seems to be gone. Um, Project Q, from what I saw and played of it, codename Project Q, I did an early test. Um, it just felt like a battle royale shooter, to be honest. Like, I know they said it wasn't that, but basically like anything Overwatch, Apex... Couple of an arena <laughs> shooter. It's not battle royale. It's an arena shooter. Yeah, and I I played it for like twenty minutes, and I was like, this is just not fun for me. Like everything was like bright orange and blue and stuff, and neon pinks and everything, and a bit like Hyperscape. It basically felt like Hyperscape jumping and running around in a smaller arena, and wasn't fun. I mean. I have a bit of a rant about it yesterday on X-Pass, but it's just Ubisoft chasing trends, but coming to the market way too late and then doing a mediocre job. Yeah. So Project I, Q's gone. If it doesn't... If you come to the, if you come to a genre late, you need to smash, smash the competition. Otherwise, people will jump in and go, hey, this is cool, but I'd rather play Apex. I'd rather play Overwatch. I'd rather play Fortnite, whatever. Like, 
and then you just bounce. I think that is being the problem with Ubisoft's like multiplayer games, like Hyperscape, like Roller Champions. They're not necessarily bad games. They're just not good enough. When there's bet, literally they've come to the market significantly later than other players, and then doing a not as good job. Yeah, the like so issue is there is like the ask is, oh, you have to abandon all the progress you've made on this other game, which is basically the same game, and come to ours and stay there. Like that's yeah. such a big ask. Like, and people will day one. But if you go, say, if you're big into Overwatch, so in this game, Project Q, as an arena shooter, interests you because you're into arena shooters, you go over and go, yeah, I had a good time. Back to Overwatch. But I really enjoy Overwatch. And then you just go back to Overwatch. Yeah. So it has to be better. Yeah. yeah well, Otherwise, people just go back to what they're playing. Well, we saw that with Hyperscape. It was out for like, yeah, what, less exactly. than six months? That is, yeah, All because that by, the time, by the time Hyperscape came out, um, PUBG and like Fortnite have exploded the genre. Big players like um, Activision give the genre the Call of Duty treatment. The market Apex was doing really well. Basically, the market was already saturated. And then, if you're not better than them, yeah, why? What's your purpose? Yeah, carving out your, your niche is is so so hard, especially when all the so, other big players have got such a grasp on it right now. Yeah, while it sucks for the developers working on this, it's probably the right decision. Uh, yeah, it seems yeah. like it, and um, I don't know if you've seen news uh, as of yesterday as well, but apparently Skull and Bones pre-orders are, all, are beginning to be automatically refunded as well via the PlayStation Store. So I don't—I know it, we announced last week it was delayed, but then pre-orders being refunded seems to be mm, mm. maybe a few more rough seas for Skull and Bones. Does that indicate uh, anything yeah, I else? I don't think that's getting cancelled. I think it's too long in development, and unlike a Project Q, which is half, it's kind of half announced. Oh yeah, no one knew anything about Project Q. Yeah, I think Skull and Bones they have to release it almost. Well, why, Otherwise, why... it's basically ten years of development just down the drain. Mm. They need to try and get some revenue back. Does it not worry you? They're going to take a hit. Oh God, yeah, now, I mean, like refunding them now after me. it's been like. Del- del- like why not like when it was delayed previously why not refund them then and like now they're suddenly like oh now we'll give you your money the f- back the fight they're very much firefighting at the I mean moment. legally it's any f- how long can you hold on to a pre-order like if you keep delaying and delaying it, it can the customers like is there like a rule where maybe it kick triggers and says like look if you don't have a definitive I- date for when it is released and you've delayed it three times now our customers have got like a hundred pound on a deluxe edition sat here like we need to give them their money back. We can't just in perpetuity keep hold of someone's deposit essentially for a pre-order. I imagine yeah, they might need to because of the cash situation. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So either way, uh, that's happening as well. So that's Project Q done. Skull and Bones seemingly lost out to sea. Um, I keep. I'll stand by. X Defiant. Don't bother with it. Ubisoft. Like just like Project Q. I think we saw what yeah. little we saw of X Defiant. No one is going to be interested in that game. It's Call of Duty, effectively, but made by Ubisoft, so it's probably not going to be as good as Call of Duty, so it goes back to what is its purpose. And it's also not even like a couple of years later than it should be. This is probably about 15 years later than it should be. Yeah, it's uh, rough going at the moment. Of course, we still got uh, we still don't really know when Assassin's Creed Mirage is coming out, because that, that's due out, what, this spring? It's smaller title, yeah. single-player, standalone, probably 40, 50 quid, I think, it launches at. I've got high hopes for that. I love myself some Assassin's Creed game, so it's taking it back to its roots. This could be the kind of beginning of maybe getting Ubisoft a bit more in people's good books, but we'll have to see. Um, Ubisoft also... I think there's some changes in leadership need to happen first. Well, we'll talk about that. We talked about that yesterday yeah. on x We did. Um, alongside some Beyond Good and Evil updates too. Uh, moving on though, <coughs> pardon me, one of the updates to come on this week uh, was a seeming leak for... Rocksteady's upcoming title, The Suicide Squad Kills the Justice League, uh, due out later this year. Um, we saw a leaked screenshot come out that apparently shows off potential season pass and or cosmetic microtransactions within the game, which has ruffled a few feathers. For everyone who's already maybe on the fence with the upcoming Suicide Squad game after the, let's say, failure of Gotham Knights when that launched earlier this year... Um, Obviously, no one's talking about Gotham Knights anymore. I haven't even seen anything about Gotham Knights since that launch week. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fans are pointing to various things on the screenshot, suggesting it's going to be rife with live service elements. A battle pass section does appear. Various currencies and some sort of level system on each character, possibly pertaining to their gear. I'll throw it over to you guys. 
what Rob, you could take this one. I was going yeah, on. right. So forgot to say. <laughs> I want to talk more about like a general trend, which I see like a lot of developers going down, and like they're using this excuse, like, oh, it, this is these like elements are just cosmetic or just what this and that kind of. It doesn't affect gameplay, but cosmetics do affect gameplay. It's part of the game, and I don't like how they're trying to like distinguish these two elements. Like, like we were talking about Ghost of Shima at the start. If they like introduced a, a bunch of kind of cosmetic changes or, or things like that to, to that game as part of a, a service, then it changes the feel and the, the nature of the game. Same with Spider Man, when it had like if you took out all like the suits in in the kind of Sony Spider Man and then put them behind like this kind of I don't know, game pass or like past service or whatever. Yeah. It fundamentally changes the game and waters it down in my eyes and i think suicide squad is a game that does not need any more watering down i think the reason for that trend is unfortunately us gamers because we buy this shit yeah it's it's been enabled for so long yeah well that's it and this i mean suicide squad looks pretty much like avengers but with a weaker ip to be honest Mm -hmm. and but it looks like the same kind of generic Hey, he, form a team, a couple of team with a very like with your friends and just jump in and very kind of actually fairly standard combat that is just give a bit of a DC facelift, and then all the it feels like rather than trying to produce a good interesting game and developing a game, it feels like they've just manufactured what's already out there, put slapped an IP on it, and then found a way to just monetize it. It feels like just a cynical way of just continually to monitor monetize something rather than doing what I think most gamers would actually say they want, even if they do buy this crap. Not necessarily the game, the cosmetics, when I say crap. Yeah. It's that we want good games. We want developers to be creative. It's a creative industry. Show me something that I haven't seen. And I, from what I've seen of this game, I've seen this game tons of times, just not with a Suicide Squad label on it, I, I skin on it. And I wasn't interested in what came before either. It just... Yeah, I think there's that added risk of just... Like, we said so much at the start of the show about Avengers, but it's you took a studio that makes fantastic single-player games and the Batman Arkham games, a wonderful trilogy, revered as some of the best games, uh, superhero games of all time, and you put them on a multiplayer project. It I can see just a, the same three-year cycle of... I don't think it's even three years. Don't you think that? Nope. Um, I think look look at um, Gotham Knights. We've all, we've just said that it basically seems like dead. There's no mention of it anywhere. It's just I've seen it on sale. I already. think I think, I think developers this, are praying it just gets like forgotten about. Really. Yeah. Yeah, but that you should that shouldn't ever be the case. It's like of a game, if because it's as again, it's a creative industry. You shouldn't want people to just forget about your games you should want people to enjoy them i like, no, but here's a crazy thing okay and like we talk, i talk about this more in like the xbox podcast where it's like if it's like when it comes to kind of share prices and things like that a shitty game lingering around and having a bad reputation and kind of like poisoning the well for longer can be more detrimental to like a game just instantly disappearing off people's like kind of mind and stuff like that so it, it's it, a it damages sh- reputation slowly over time. Yeah. And so, like, if, if a game comes out there. and it's a bit of a flop, people move on unless you're getting a long string of flops. But a game that is like lingers, like it's like, are you doing anything interesting at the moment, or are you just trying to keep this thing afloat? Mm. Yeah. So yeah. in a lot of ways, it yeah. could be to a benefit for a game just to instantly die, like Gotham Knight seems to have done. But um, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, speaking of things that have died though moving on uh, to the next topic of the week uh, metal gear rising voice actor claims announcement is coming in the next few weeks so quentin flynn who played raiden in metal gear solid 2 4 and rising um was uh, tweeted a video advertising uh, on his cameo page where of course every famous celebrity does cameos now i'm guessing he just puts on raiden's voice and says happy birthday whoever insert name here um which i feel like snake did like david hater doing it would be like cool as shit Ryden doing it, I don't know if I would be as like enthused about it. Um, not that I'm giving Ryden hate, it just 
Snake's the one you want to wish you happy birthday at the end yeah. of the day. Which they do in I can't Gear believe. Solid 4. If you set your birthday it's one of them, like, the game. Your mum gets you your mum gets you a cameo for a happy birthday, knows you're a big Metal Gear Solid fan, can't afford, afford David Hater, so you get riding. Mm, <laughs> like, oh, man. But uh, I, yeah. back to the story, Quentin Flynn... Um, on Monday, a follower replied to the video, uh, the cameo video, stating that the 10th anniversary of Metal Gear Rising would be in February 2023. Uh, this caused another follower to reply earlier, wondering if it's possible we could see a Metal Gear Rising 2 on the way. Uh, perhaps an announcement. Um, and Flynn replied with, stay tuned for things to be announced in the coming weeks with a winky emoji. So has he let the cat out of the bag? And I guess Rob, I'll throw it up to you. Did you actually play Metal Gear Rising? Because this is the one, Rising and Revenger, Revengeance, was it? Revengeance? Revengeance? Revengeance, I, I yeah. Didn't so that's like the ride of... No, so they're, they're very different games from like kind of the <coughs> core numbered titles. Um, I played it, yeah, and like they were fine. They were kind of more like hack and slash than mm. kind of espionage, if you want. And yeah, that they were fine titles, like... Um, there was no kind of high praise or anything I've got for them, but they were, they were solid. Um, I'm I'm not sure if I want a, a Metal Gear Rising two. I think mm. I'd, I, I think like the actual franchise needs more attention on its kind of main world, if you want, because obviously, um, God, what was that terrible one called? Um, That's the one I couldn't think was, of. Was it Survive with the zombies? Survive, yeah. Like that kind of did so much damage to the to the franchise that. The next one needs to be something really kind of fan pleasing, whether that's like a, a remake or a remaster of Metal Gear Solid One or something like that. Um, but I'd the fact say like, a remake of One is would is one of them like it's it's up there with the Final Fantasy Seven remake as how much people want it to happen and yeah. just tr- the industry is just trying to will this thing to existence. Yeah, in Konami, just yeah. seemingly just don't pay attention to. They've yeah, it's got their pachinko machines on the go, and they're they're quite content. But yeah, I think Metal Gear One is like it's it must be like the last major popular IP that hasn't had any kind of remaster re- treatment. In, yeah, it's never no, no been touched. That's it, the thing. There's not even like a. It's ripe for it as well. Yeah, it would be amazing. But uh, I guess we'll find out in the coming weeks as February and the anniversary does come round to it. Uh, hopefully, something new coming out of Konami. We've seen um, Silent Hills be addressed uh, with a lot. I think what this is there seven games coming out. I think did we break down Richie? It was like. <laughs> With yeah, and asking for more pictures as well. Yeah, movies, everything like that. So either way, let, let's see some more Metal Gear. I think it's about time. With or without Kojima, I think it's about time it moved on to whatever's next for it. Um, speaking of cleaning things uh, from back in the past, uh, The Simpsons Hit and Run, probably the best Simpsons game of all time. Uh, another, just to stoke the fires of speculation as well, uh, the soundtrack for the original game, uh, released on Spotify this week, randomly out of nowhere, 2003's The Simpsons Hit and Run, cult classic, full soundtrack dropped on Spotify, sparking speculation that that could be a potential return for the game, um, making it to our screens. This is like, I know it's all speculation, but why on earth would Disney slash Fox um, agree to put the soundtrack out randomly in 2022 if there's not something in the works. Did they agree to it? Or could this just be a license expiring? Because it's about 20 years. It's a full 54-song track list, though, that's never existed on yeah. Spotify before. It's not like it's been renewed. Yeah. It's just randomly appeared with proper key art. And yeah, and I'm just wondering, has has the license just expired, so now it's fair game to just stick on there? I mean, it's Simpsons. I, so I, it's, I don't it's know. Owned like, by, I can't imagine any Simpsons soundtrack whatsoever goes free to license when it's. That's true. Yeah, like it's mm-hmm. still on air. Like there's episodes still coming out every every year. But I mean, I I love Simpsons Set and Run. That was kind of like after the big GTA fix. It was incredible. Had, was like, what are you telling me? I can just play the Simpsons and Grand Theft Auto together, all fully voice yeah, acted yeah. as well. Like like none of this. Like we're going to hire someone who sounds like them. This is like all genuine. Yeah. Um, I had a great time back in, on PlayStation 2 with this, yeah. so I'd play it. Like, the optimist in me says, like, I, I, I'm hoping there's, like, a new title coming out yeah. for it. Like, in reality, I think probably there's been, like, a bunch of media which like, has found been the, Someone's found the CD. Someone's found the CD mm. with the track, the track list on while they've been, like, cleaning out the office and went, should we just put this on Spotify, guys? <laughs> like, I, I imagine, like, there'll be a bunch I hope, of... I hope it is stuff. a new game. 
Yeah. yeah, so there'll be like loads of different kind of like soundtracks for like different TV shows or properties over the years, and it'll be uploaded yeah. in bulk. But like maybe this is the only one that people noticed. I hope it's a game, though. God, I hope it's a game. Yeah, yeah same. I'm, I hope it's not too big of a game. Bring out maybe the thirty pound price point, just to have a smaller experience where it's just thirty pounds, chaotic fun. Maybe a PlayStation Plus game or a Game Pass game, that kind of thing. I mean, it could be playstation classics right realistically like we, we give playstation yeah. shit for Could not doing anything with the classics outside of like siphon filter and a couple of random ass games like i know we probably in our heart of hearts want a full ground up remaster but if they just put out a polished version of the ps2 title like they did with vice city in san andreas then i'll take that as well because like let's face it yeah. we're not going to play this for as long as we probably dream to you'll probably play it for two hours and go ah nostalgia Anyway, it's a yeah, terrible it's... game. It doesn't play very well. The mechanics are awkward. That's why I'm saying a smaller price point yeah. kind of or, thing. Or included. Right. So yeah, I, w- I would take that. I also <laughs> don't know who's listening to this on Spotify. I can't imagine it's like the most banging of soundtracks for 54, uh, 54 songs to listen to on Apple Music or Spotify when you're out doing your morning run or you're, you're at the gym, you whack on some <laughs> Simpsons back in track. But... Stranger things have happened. You know what? If, if if I had a massive amount of nostalgia for this game, I might be that guy because I do listen to sometimes like video game soundtracks at work and stuff. You are that guy. Um, rounding the show out this week, juice two quick stories. Um, quick one: Ultimate Sackboy launches next month. You can bag a preload now on uh, Google Play uh, and the Apple uh, iPhone Store. Um, bit random, but Sackboy is making his next adventure. Uh, on mobile phones it's literally one of those run run adventures i don't have any footage of it but it's uh your beh- camera's behind sack boy he runs down the streets you swipe left you swipe right to endless run between it. three lanes and avoid obstacles and fancy suits and cosmetics dressed as our little sack companion but uh yeah that is what it is and then finally returnal uh, will be getting a pc release this month as well uh, returnal is one of those places exclusive it's the only one i've not really tried out either of you two checked it out yet no, I'm I the same as you. Is it, is it on just, PlayStation Plus in some form? I feel like I've... I, th- I, I think it is, it. yeah. I think it... It's, about two, it's coming up on two-year-old this this spring, summer. Um, I feel like it's one of those where I'd enjoy it, but I think at the time when everyone was saying how like the difficulty spike in it, like Dark Souls almost, it just immediately put me off. It's a roguelike, yeah. and I know how you don't like to lose your stuff when you die. Yeah, it pisses like, me off. You like you're like me. You like to play through a narrative where roguelikes tend to be. Like, you jump, you jump in. It's more about the gameplay rather than the the story. Yeah. So like, yeah, you you you're meant to get better and better and better each time you go through a run. Yeah. But it's just one of them. Uh, PC coming out. Minimum specifications are up on the website now. Uh, it's going to offer like graphics mode, performance mode, uh, ray tracing, ultra wide resolution, all of that sparkly jazz. You PC Wait. folks like out there. It won best action game at the Game Awards 2021. It, again, a very well reviewed game, but just I just don't think it's in our wheelhouse. Um, but that's all we've got time for on this week's Talking the PS. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in, watched, liked, subscribed, and clicked that bell so you're kept in with the loop with all the great content. Don't forget tonight, click a cast episode two. We break down the Last of Us episode two, Infected, where we pick up with Joel and Ellie's adventure. Can't wait for it, Richie. Looking forward to it. Absolutely, 100%. And if you haven't done so already, check out episode one. Uh, it's fantastic. Did you actually watch the show, Rob? Just is a quick, like... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched thing. it. Uh, quick thoughts, impressions, was why we round up. Fantastic. It was such a, such like a faithful adaptation of, of the game. Like, even um, my girlfriend, who hasn't actually seen the... Hasn't played the game at all. Mm. Um, oh, you the scene, the scene when they're in yeah. the pickup, she was like, this feels very, very game-like. I'm mm. like, yeah, like... And that's kind of like a testament to... That's to exactly well what my done. dad said. He was like, there's a lot of things that felt video gamey, and that was the exact mm-hmm. same scene. I was like, well, that is actually the game shot for shot almost. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, again, it's so good. Again, talking about people who haven't seen it. I have heard um, your girlfriend wasn't too happy that we never found out what happened to Mercy the dog. <laughs> that was like a big yeah. sticking point. It's <laughs> yes. like, why do we not find out what happened? <laughs> that to is. Not happy. I know she she's like, listening to this. That right. is a very like, hair reaction to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, can't wait for it. Uh, tri- off to a terrific start. I think over 20 million people checked out episode one, the best opening since uh, House of the Dragons. So another hit on HBO's hands, it looks like. And we'll break it all down on the Clicker cast. So don't forget to follow or subscribe that over on social media and uh, keep it locked to Helix Plays Games for all that content. We'll be back this Thursday with another live stream. Can't wait to see you. My name's been Chris. I've been Richie. And I've been Rob. 
We've been Helix Plays Games. And remember, folks, play whatever makes you the happiest. Take care. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.